That's better. Um, my day job these days is a subject leader for ICT education at Roehampton University, which is, must be one of the best jobs in the world. Um, we have about oh, 1,000 students, undergraduate and postgraduate students each year, trained to become primary teachers. One of the things with which I agree with the Secretary of State for Education is that this next generation of teachers are going to be truly outstanding. Be excited about the people who are joining your staff in September and in the September beyond that, because they are absolutely brilliant. Are there any former Roehampton students in the room by any chance? Oh, never mind. Okay. Um, who here is actually a primary school teacher themselves? That's brilliant. Okay. It's great to have all of you here. My colleague here, Dave Smith, do you want to say who you are, Dave? Where'd yeah, you I'm absolutely, Miles. I'm ICT advisor for the uh, Haven School Improvement Services here in uh, North East London. And uh, my role is to support schools across all phases and uh, types um, within the LA and beyond uh, to develop effective use of ICT uh, to enhance teaching and learning and other aspects of whole school improvement for ICT. So delighted to be here this afternoon and uh, we've worked on things over the last couple of years and we're going to have a chat about that with you this afternoon. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming along. We want to t start by addressing some of the issues raised by Mr. Gove on Wednesday about this notion of the open source ICT curriculum that he says from September there is no program of study. There is no attainment target either. It's up to you as a profession to decide what you're going to teach. No longer just how you're going to teach it, but the content of the curriculum itself becomes something over which we as teachers, we as schools have control. We want to also talk about how you ensure that sense of progression through the primary phase. We'll look at one aspect of that. I want to talk a little about creativity, about creative learning, but also about creative teaching, that this is such a tremendous opportunity to reinvent the way which we teach our lessons. And so I want to talk a little about that. Um, we're going to bring in some stuff about assessment for learning. And, you know, in the absence of an attainment target, how do we go about assessing their learning? And of course, there are lots of easy ways, lovely ways of doing that. We were going to show you a whole smorgasbord of uh, cool tools, but really we want to focus on Scratch today. So if you want to hear about Google Survey, Inkscape, or FreeMind, hang around at the end and we'd be happy to talk about those too. But our focus is going to be on Scratch. Dave, do you want to start talking about curriculum things? Absolutely, I'm going to have a sit down. No, you have a sit down, you know, absolutely. Um, this microphone might work as might that one if you That's don't. Okay. okay. Yeah, I'm sure. Can you hear me all right, folks? Pick it up okay? Well, I mean, you know, here we are. An open source curriculum. Well, I know a few years ago, when it came to devising curriculum school, I was looking around myself and thinking, we need to go and buy, buy all this content that we need. We need to get all the licenses for it. But there's so much out there at the moment. And should we, should, we, it should we accept now that, you know, the curriculum in school is a single static document that never changes? That it's, you know, this is where we got Michael Gove here saying this, yeah? The other day. Let's have a little look at his, what he's actually saying. You see that all right? You need me to read it out. We can if you want to. But actually, I think maybe that uh, if you read the first two paragraphs, I think if I just pick up the last one, that might be useful just to reinforce points, okay? We've got those words there, freedom and autonomy. When we came into the room this afternoon, colleagues here are already talking to us about what that potentially means for us. Exciting, opportunities, things we can do, and it says at the bottom, disapplying the ICT program study is about freedom. It will mean that for the first time, teachers will be allowed to cover truly innovative, specialist and challenging topics. Is that the first time really? Have you not been doing it already? Has that not been happening already? You sure about that? Has it been happening already? Yes. Yes. Some of us, not all of us. Okay, maybe that's why some of us are here this afternoon as well. So an interesting and challenging time for us, as it said, truly innovative, specialist and challenging topics. So we'll pick up that a little bit later and uh, we're going to have a look at some results, especially in the light of this uh, computer science debate that's going on at the moment as well. So uh, just an interesting point to think about. So we've been working together, Miles from Roehampton uh, University, um, us at the Haven School Improvement Services, also had a guy called Terry Friedman, ICT ed in Education. You may have heard Terry, great guy, follow him on the web, please do. And uh, Rising Stars Publishers did develop 
a product called Switched on ICT. Now, we're just mentioning this in passing this afternoon, folks, because this is where we came together. We saw a gaping hole in the curriculum. We saw that there was a need to develop something to, to be up to date. Remember, the QCA units were around and developed around 1999. Think of what your mobile phone was like in 1999 and look at it today. You still got the same one? Maybe it's time for an upgrade. Um, so, we worked together to develop these, these units. We've shared them and uh, worked in our schools and they're rolling out in schools across the country. But it's been through this that we came to this idea of this, actually, open source curriculum. Lots of freely available tools that are there for us to use, or things we've already got in our school, plus a few cameras, maybe some recording devices, to develop a curriculum. And that's where we came together. So this is why I'm delighted to be uh, here with Miles this afternoon. And at the moment through that, that has developed on now, and Switched on ICT actually has a community that's been launched this week here at BET with resources. You can go and have a look on that yourself if you want to. Um, so even if you've not gotten the resource systems yourselves, you can have a little look around and see the, some of the things that are being posted up on there. Because there's a need for us to share that advice, those ideas about curriculum as well. And uh, in the absence of any, um, any particular schemes of work coming from you know, DFE, what have we got to have? Do we just leave ourselves with a gaping hole? We need to be providing ourselves, teachers, practitioners, teaching assistants, whoever's taking and working with the children in classes, with support materials that are going to help us. A lady down here said to, to, to me, you know, how do we ensure that uh, I'm not the only person who has to teach the children a certain area, perhaps, and you know, somebody over here said control technology is an example. Well, those resources have to be there, those supporting resources, maybe video clips and other things. And when we develop this, we brought those things together. So, and we'll take you through a bit of that this afternoon. But uh, that's where we came together. That's where we're at at the moment. So we just want to underpin it so you get a bit of an idea of where we're at. Okay. So, what do we mean about, um, what do we mean about ICT? What does it mean to us? And what, do we, what, what does education mean to us as well? What should we be developing? So there's a few key words coming out from that. And if you look this up on the, uh, on the web, you can see the, uh, the address at the bottom there. But I think it's about what's our vision for education. What do you think it should be? And what do you think we should be providing our pupils, our children, our students with in, in schools in this day and age? And if we look at this, so rational autonomy as an educational aim, if we go here and look down at this, as we're actually saying, and this is that we should be looking to enable pupils to deal with ideas themselves. Should we be like a sausage factory where we're bringing pupils in, we're giving them an activity, they're all coming up with the out same outcomes? Should we be telling them what to do? Should we be giving them the tools or should they be picking the tools themselves? Okay? When you've got to do something yourself, when you're faced with a challenge, you know, we might go out and ask for advice, but a lot of the time we're going to have to procure that advice and support ourselves. Isn't that something we've got to be developing and isn't that something we've got to be putting through ICT as well? So it's crucial for us to be thinking about that when we're developing a curriculum in school. It's about developing autonomy. It's about making sure that pupils are able to actually deal with ideas themselves. Okay, so that's very, very important. Moving on from here, and then Miles, just to reinforce this point here, we're talking about a hundred words, and this is something that uh, you could just yeah, tell folks here. There's a challenge on the NACE um, ICT advisory list, if ever so, about, you know, what is the purpose of ICT education? Can you say what the purpose is of ICT education? Is it to make sure that the students are learning something that they can learn and what ICT curriculum should look like for ICT education? Should be like in a hundred words or less, which to me is a real challenge, because as you can tell, hundred words is not something I'm comfortable with. This is my attempt at it. Have a read through and put your arm up if there's something you disagree with. Please do, please do take photographs, tweet it out, that'd be good, yeah? The challenge to you, not so much now as maybe on the train at home, is what would your number of words be? You said, what are we trying to achieve with ICT in our school? How would you summarise that? A hundred words or less, or for those of you on Twitter, a hundred and forty characters. Yeah, that's even more challenging, isn't it? Does anybody want to argue about it? Does anyone agree with it? I think I don't want the words into 
Anything else coming through? So independent? Anything else? Are we thinking primary children here? Well, I was thinking about ICT in general. Do you think this is too ambitious for the primary place? I was thinking that networks and things. Oh, I know. I don't know. I don't know. Oh, yes, it's an engine. Close it down. But I have no idea how a network works. But by the time a child leaves primary school, I don't think they will understand that the internet and the web are not the same. Is that too ambitious of me? <coughs> Do we understand what the difference is between those things as well, actually, Miles? That was quite. Do you understand it? Do we close up? That plays the other on the spot this afternoon. But. Uh, <laughs> the internet is the plumbing, yeah? It's the connections, it's the cables, it's the computers, it's the Wi Fi touch stuff, and the satellite things, and all of that stuff. The web is one of the services which works via the internet. Some of the internet of these web servers and they just sit there waiting to provide us with web, page, web pages and we connect to them via the internet. Oh, we do, yes. I mean, I, I, I do similar exercise with my students and the number of panels that go up and what's the difference between the internet and the web is relatively small. That's not just because they've already gone on the seat by that. Okay. I'm not, I'm not a, a, a teacher of in the industry. Yeah. It's good time, yeah. For me, I think that last sentence is spot on, um, but there seems to me to be a kind of difference between that and the first sentence, which is very much about what ICT education was like when I was it was all about starting off, this is a monitor, this is a keyboard, this is how the computer works, and how the kind of the plumbing works, like I said, from an industry point of view, I think what we're really much more interested in is people knowing how, exactly what that last sentence says, which is about, you know, how do you use this stuff to, to solve real world problems? And for me, there's a real disparity between what says at the beginning and what says at the end. I don't see the disparity in there, as I you. I think that we want both as part of education. Education in primary school shouldn't, in my view, be about training children to use particular applications. We've done quite a lot of that over the years. It should be about the flexibility of my being able to uh, measure my CT capability for years to be sit down in front of a program we've never seen before and still be able to. Die. You can do that by exposure to lots of different technologies. But that deeper understanding of how the technology works is, I think, part of the process of establishing that flexibility of life and realizing, okay, I can apply these ideas in this different context. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not about this is a moment, this is a no. whatever. It is actually about it's all Software is one thing. It's it's funny though you say that though this is a monitor this is a keyboard this is a mouse I still see that scheme of work in schools. So when I visit schools and part of our work is to is to uh, you know those are you know people do need to know those maybe children need to know those bits don't know but actually it's about taking it on and if we're not careful you know that dusty curriculum is is no is not going to be moved on so uh, I think that's crucial so it's still out there you think it's only your your you know when you were at school or I was at school I don't. Like we had a BBC in the secondary school and that was it, but, sir? I particularly like the fact that you don't use the word skills. I'm sure it's deliberate. It's false. Yeah. But the, the skills are things which they do, or many of them, I don't want to over, over generalize here, which children do pick up for themselves. When you look at the, the skills which they join you in reception, they know that you know. There, is good, there are going to be a number of children in every reception class who can get onto the internet and find the CD these you know, the QCA scheme of work, bless it, leaves using the web until year six. <laughs> 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 this is so long ago. Well, yes. The, the, yeah. the, the skills that the children have today yeah. are so much more advanced than they were, say, five years ago. Absolutely. There's a really good, there's a really good video, on, you may have seen it on YouTube, uh, where there's a, there's a child, a very young child, actually trying to do this to a magazine uh, on the pictures to actually, you know, stretch them. You know, Sir was asking there about earlier on about iPads and how they're going to affect us in the classroom. Well, you know what, you know, if the te us as teachers and practitioners, teaching assistants haven't actually used one ourselves, but the children have, how does that affect things as well? So that's another issue to be thinking about. But you know, that's a, a little video has been around a little bit uh, recently as well. So just going to take you through some models of curriculum design. Uh, which one is uh, the current uh, program of study for ICT? Is it the one at the top? 
the second one on the left, the third one on the left, or the yellow one on the right? Which one is it? On who votes for number one? Who, who votes for number two, the second one down, where it starts digital literacy? Who votes for number three? Who votes for number four? So a few of us, yeah, okay, maybe we should have put out voting response systems, student response systems this morning, this afternoon, Miles. Um, okay, um, and actually it's the first one. That's how it stands at the moment, or at the moment, is the key, is the, uh, you know, to word I think there, but it's actually the right term because it's going to, uh, not begin here, is it? Don't repeat the link. Don't aspects of other bits. Yeah. Model number one, you know, I reject the Secretary of State's premise that it was the national curriculum's fault that some of the ICT lessons that it had adapted or even done harmful techniques he used. That actually, that is the national curriculum that permits us to do that, has permitted us to do I so much. I disagree with the national okay. curriculum, so I don't know. Uh, okay. But those headings are a good bit of thinking about the subject. You know, the making things happen includes programming stuff that is easy to see something which we teach in school. So the, the, the structure as it stands, it's, it's, it's very difficult to say there is something wrong with that. But yeah, the open source idea that, that again, I you know, talked about on Wednesday, one of the principles under which a lot of open source software is built is this notion of interoperable components. So once we get this freedom come September 1st, then take something from the yellow curriculum, which is the, other, the NACE ICT curriculum, take something from this rather vague green curriculum, which is the Community and Schools curriculum, buy them to make something that's right for your school. You will have the freedom to do that. Absolutely. And that, that's, that's it. Because you're going to have to make those decisions. That's a real change, isn't it? So at the moment, if we say, okay, well, I've got, I've, you know, we've had to work to the one at the top up to now, if we are, you know, applying ourselves to that. But uh, beyond that, now we're going to have to look around and make those decisions for us. What works for us? What works in our own educational establishment? So there are some different curriculum models there. And as uh, as Miles said, you know, the one uh, on the bottom right-hand corner here is the NACE curriculum that was launched this week here at BET. So you might want to have a little look for that one, okay? So uh, it would be worthwhile it's having a look. Key Stage 3 at the moment. Yes. Uh, we're going to be working on Key Stage 1, Key Stage 2 extension. Okay, so just in a moment then. It's a question for you to think about. Right, there you are. You are now in charge of designing your curriculum. That's your job. All right, so I think we're going to leave you there. And um, so... Here's some subject areas, just some areas, okay? Um, I want you to talk to the person next to you, or you can internalise if there isn't anybody next to you, or the person behind you, if there's nobody to the side of you, in front of you, um, and actually work out one or two activities of how you could support these different aspects of the curriculum through ICT. Can I make it more challenging? Of course, Miles. Okay. And finally, it's an easy task, if you like, differentiated learning. It's all right. We like gifted and talented, but, don't we? For the higher ability amongst you, rather than just using ICT in these contexts, can you teach ICT in this context? Can you take their ICT capability forward as well as their learning within that subject? Yes. Okay. So we'll give you two minutes to have a discussion about that, and then we'll come back and we may pick up some of the uh, two or three points from you. Okay, starting now. Go. Okay, your curriculum models need to be ready in about 30 seconds, folks. 
It's equivalent of between now and September in real time. <laughs> you like that one, do you? Oh. I always want to play the music from Countdown at this point. Yes. Yeah. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, folks. We didn't know, we didn't tell you that Ofsted are just walking in the door now to ask you because you've just developed the curriculum for your school and they want to see it. So actually, no, we're, that's the that's the, the an extra level of challenge there, Miles, wouldn't it be? Okay. What about two or three people from the floor like to give us some feedback on? Uh, on that task, okay. Who's going to who's going to feed back to us? Look at that hand go up at the back. That's what I like. It's his idea. Oh, that's all right. Go on. It's, it's your idea because you put your hand up as well. There you go. Okay. Okay. Right, so integrate them together. Yep. Okay, fine. Any comment on that at all, uh, Miles? Lovely idea. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who teaches in Sheffield who used to take his year seven class down into the town centre to do, you know, the usual sort of town visit geography field trip, and now does it all via Google Maps, which seems a shame, doesn't it? You know, the, the real still matters, but there's so much to do with the mobile devices. Sir. So. Then there's an addition to that. Oh. Which brings in the mobile device. Yes. But if you take them down to Regent's Park, stick them in front of the back. Use the interactive mobile devices um, optical Google search Google. facility yes. Google to bring up the information and tell you what it's about. And you can still have it as an outside trip as well as using the tech. Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> Do you yeah, I think so. I, I just want to throw it back to you. Which year group would you put it in? Agree? Do everyone agree? Do you think that's that's about right? Right place to put it? You go higher. I think go low. It just sounds. This sounds like play your cards right with Bruce Forsyth. Did you know? Okay, very good. Ah. So here's a challenge, then, isn't it? Here's a challenge. Okay, you're setting this up. You're going to have to decide where this is being taught as well. So it's not just what you're teaching. It's when and where and why. And how much money did you save as well? That's another key question as well. And so there's a bit of maths coming in there. That's excellent. Okay, thank you very much for that one. So we started to develop some curriculum ideas here. One more. Let's take another one from the floor. Let's have another, let's have another hand going up. Sir, over there. I don't know if it's relevant, but I've used um, things like Zara or any vector-based drawing program to design an airport lounge and get the children to actually move the bits of furniture around or create their own uh, and learn how you can actually create objects, copy and paste them, uh, and put them where you want them. I don't know if that's relevant. Which, which subject area? Area or areas would that fit into? The first two, art and design and design technology. Only? I heard maths over here. Any others? Any others? Okay, so you're starting to pick up quite a number of different areas. So that's your decision. So you, if you are developing the curriculum, you're going to have to make that decision and choose and say and give a reason why as well if you are putting it together. So 
if it's relevant, you want to really put, the, you know, you want to put that stick in the sand and say, actually, I think this is relevant, and the reasons are these as well. So that autonomy brings freedom, but it also brings a lot of challenge as well, doesn't it, for us to be thinking about why we should do things and where it fits in. Okay, and is it is it educationally sound as well? You're talking about skills progression, aren't you? At which year group? So you really need to link progression to your ICT. So. Do you need an ICT system or have it embedded in subject? I think you need. No, Miles, go on, I like it. <laughs> yeah. I think you need an ICT curriculum. Yeah. You don't necessarily need an ICT lesson. Mm. ICT is a time to yes. subject. You do need the kit, though. Call me old fashioned, if you will, but I think ICT works better on learning computers or something that looks like a computer there. Yeah, it's quite handy, really, isn't it? Yeah, not bad. It's quite good, too, yeah. <laughs> there is an argument, and there's a great website called CS Unplugged, where you do the whole computing without any sort of actual computers there, but not so much in primary school. Chance. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so resourcing is at the moment an issue, but if we get the one to one devices by one means or another, then even that becomes something you don't worry about. And okay, if we're gonna do a job for the lesson, get your devices out. Yeah, you choose as well. You know, why is it we we you know we could structure the task and activity for the children, couldn't we? But could it be that they are actually thinking about that as well? So, you know, people have said here this afternoon, oh, we could use these these tools, these yeah, but would we would we actually be saying to them, like, look, you know what, there's the device, okay, there's the activity, so I said over there, you've got to develop a airport lounge. Um, right, go and then you can choose what you want to use. Because who's to say they're not already using these type tools at home as well? Google SketchUp and other things like that. It could well be. And how much do we know about how much what our children know already? before they come into school. How much do we devise a curriculum in a school around where they're from and what their experiences are? And we talked about foundation stage earlier on, didn't we? And we're just mentioning that. But how much time do we actually spend doing that? So when we're devising a curriculum, shouldn't we be asking them as well? Okay, there was a question at the back there. Just one other thing and we'll move on from this bit. Mm-hmm. Mm. I agree. It's, it's a hard one, isn't it, really? It's also a case of uh, teachers' own knowledge. You know, if you're a specialist teacher, you've got a specialist, a generalist teacher, who is maybe not up to date. Because trying to keep up to date with technology is really difficult. Yes. And it can be very scary, I think, for some people who don't understand where it's all going. Mm. So how do you ensure that they can actually get do this where they've been sort of played safe all this time mm -hmm. and now mm -hmm. something to have to branch out mm -hmm. it's another issue. Is ICT challenging for the pupils or is it challenging it's for the, the teachers? teachers yeah. That's the, that's a key question. Just coming to CERN and we need to move on. So just that one thing. My job as an ICT teacher to be a catalyst for the children's interest, not for me to dictate what they must learn and how I assess it. Because to me that is unbelievably boring pedagogy. Um, I, I just think that that is simply, here we go again, churning out the old assessment stuff. And I honestly don't think that that's relevant. What I think is relevant is it's such a huge area that children should be allowed to take an interest in that particular thing that they really are interested in. And so I get little sisters who come up to me and say, but you made my brother into a nerd because you taught him how to program. And so, you know, I uh, feel a bit of victory there. Um, or uh, it might be that somebody else has gone off and used art rage and absolutely loves using it. Um, somebody else has gone off and used a vector book and drawing program. Somebody else has gone off and used PowerPoint and loves it to bits, etc., etc., etc. Mind you, they all seem to love PowerPoint. But anyway, the fact is that I am not there to put them into some little box that us teachers think we know better in. And it really annoys me that, that this, this kind of, we 
must keep an eye on what they're doing and track them and then be able to assess them, say that they're level four and level five at the country, as far as I'm concerned. I'm there to inspire the good old-fashioned teaching and they go off and do what they want. And then when they're good at something, I teach them or let them teach somebody else how to do that thing. That, to me, is what it's all about. It's almost a wider and longer philosophical debate outside the room this afternoon. And Miles, just want to come in quickly then yeah. before we move on to the next thing. One of the interesting implications from this disapplication of the uh, program of study is that you don't have to have the same degree child at school. There is freedom. If child A wants to learn this, they can be taught that way. You can allow that. Child B can learn something else entirely. Without the program of study method, there's no longer requirement. For all children to be taught the same thing. No, absolutely. Social, uh, really yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we look at the curriculum progression here now. So it's really good. Thank you very much for your input there. So that's that's fantastic. And part of what we worked on to develop was is trying to address some of the key issues and questions that you are raising this afternoon. Is that the teachers in our schools in 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 Havering have said we we need something to support us with. Um, a whole range of elements of the challenges that are facing us here, that the children are, are more able than we are with ICT. They're bringing skills in and, and capabilities in and knowledge in that we didn't even, you know, we, we don't have ourselves and it's scary, okay? Not just, not just control technology, but other aspects as well. So the whole idea was that we had a rationale to provide a clear teaching sequence to support teachers to develop pupils, and in this instance, very much of the moment, programming knowledge, and we developed that because we thought that was very important, and having Miles on board really helped that, skills and understanding. So the switch on ICT develop, um, resources we developed include clear learning objectives, e-safety, cross-curricular links, support for differentiation, variations to try, and web links to guides and videos, because if you haven't got the support, the lady at the back there says she's from an international school, maybe needs some help there in terms of uh, where does she refer to for how-to guides and, and a video to show our staff how to use it, and also so we're not having to address the, what the lady here said, which was, uh, you know, what happens if I'm not in that day, how's that going to be taught all that week, or, yeah? So when we developed that, we put that into there, we, so we put something called 60 second walkthroughs um, in. So I'm just going to flick through and just to look at this, a, a, the progression element of programming across the, the years. And if you want to see this, if you visit the, the, the you pop along to the Rise of Style standard uh, before you leave this afternoon, just pick up a pack or just look online for Switch and ICT. But the idea was to make sure that pupils understood elements of programming. So we don't just have it as a one-off unit sitting somewhere in year three or year two or year one and they never see it again. Love this term spiraling curriculum, don't we? So we're coming back to revisit things year on year, yeah? Okay, that's really important. So, for example, in this, this, this one here, we are treasure hunt, hunters. Pupils are, uh, you'll be excited by uh, the, the prospect of burying buried treasure, and they're gonna move a instructor programmable toy around to a map to find buried treasure, okay? Um, so, and it goes through and gives the clear um, teaching, of uh, learning objectives that we need to have from this, this unit itself. So it says, we should be expecting children to extract a programmable toy to move around maps, and they start by recording step-by-step -step instructions that build on this to produce a sequence of instructions which makes a programmable toy move along a specific, specified route. So within that, it actually says, here are the things, by the end of this unit, children will have achieved the following learning objectives. So I'm just picking up one there. To understand that sequences of instructions have a predictable outcome. So that's just one in year one and two. We build onto that going into, we are astron astronauts and we are programming on screen. And this one using uh, something that hopefully we're going to uh, just uh, a little bit of miles demonstrate at the end if we have time, um, is Scratch. Brilliant program, freely available from the web, which you can download. You can have a play with it this weekend if you want. There's a whole array of um, help guides and uh, examples to use. And it says in this one, by the end of the student, children will have understood how to, that an on-screen sprite can be controlled by input and a sequence of instructions and so on. So in here are the learning expectations. Alongside that, there are, there are we developed videos to support this. We developed assessment to support it as well. That's only just a taster of what's in there because we actually put the teaching sequences in. So it stays step one, step two, step three, and go through over a period of six lessons or six, sorry, six sessions, six weeks, however you want to do it. We make it very generic so it doesn't have to be, it depends on, you know, it doesn't have to depend on specific equipment that you've got as well. And then we move on into year three and, uh, well, sorry, unit three. And in this, in this case, we just use the, these, these ones, but you can move it around. 
doesn't necessarily have to be in year three, depends on where your pupils are at really. And in this one we're looking at um, developing cartoon animated characters. How much fun would that be for the children to be developing that sort of thing? And we had, we had one of our um, schools up from our borough yesterday and it, the children have really switched on because they're, they're actually doing it at home because they're downloading Scratch at home and they're carrying on their projects at home because they can save it on the web and work on it at home. And, you know, that's, and, you know, away from school where they've got access to equipment. So, again, that's another one. We are artists fusing geometry and art. And who would have thought that, you know, programming would include uh, art? So in this way, have you ever noticed your, your in, how, have children in your class ever noticed the links between maths and art? So we're looking at symmetry, Islamic art, all those things. So there again, if we bring up our, you know, our different areas of the curriculum, think about the overlap there, think about all those cross-curricular aspects of it, okay? And then it starts to use and work with tools in there as well, and another open source tool. And in this example, Miles, I can't remember which one it is that we're using, this one. We're using a range of things here. Oh, there you are. An art-led thing, but yes. some of this, the Islamic art particularly, lends itself to good old-fashioned logo -like. Yeah. The hands up here is who's taught logo. Well, there you go. Who's teaching logo stuff? Okay, consider a move over to Scratch. I mean, back in my day when I was teaching logo, you've got the whole square brackets and colons thing, which is there's a lot of cognitive logo for children to remember. The syntax gets in the way of the ideas. So we move over to Scratch, and it's just building block programming. We do very little typing, we just click the things together. You can focus on the logic, you can focus on the algorithm. And absolutely, and I really like this unit. I actually worked on this with some schools, and I've seen the outcomes of it as well. Summer fake games, and in this one, the, the children are creating summer fake games. So they will create, you know, uh, uh, an activity where there might be sort of like a basketball hoop, and they can then control it. They can program it, and there's a spreadsheet to work out, you know, what cost there there is for every time the ball goes through the, the hoop, and things like that. So that's integrating and bringing different aspects together and developing a whole range of, of skills there, you know, sorry, ICT knowledge and capability. Okay, so what you've got here is these things overlapping, but we're teaching programming in a fun and effective and engaging way. And actually, the outcomes we're seeing from this have been really great. And then finally, in this particular um, set of units, we've got the creating an adventure game. And uh, one of the examples is just using the, is the use of Scratch here, but there's also the use of um, PowerPoint as well. And you think, oh, well, PowerPoint? Oh, really? Should we be mentioning that? No, but it is. All the benefits of scheme of work. Oh, of course yeah, it is. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. And um, by creating um, hyperlinks between uh, slides, making choices available, and we can just build and build and build and build on that. And you know what? They're you know, freely downloadable. You know, Open Office is available with a, uh, you know, a, the equivalent tool in it, isn't it? And the children could be using that as well. So why not? Sorry, whilst we're plugging software as well, yes. Miles, I don't know if you've heard me plug this before, but I had to write about Texty's Turtle logo. Um, it is absolutely phenomenally good. And you, you children do have to type, but it's actually very easy stuff for them to type. That anything can be made into a turtle, anything, a picture of your grandma, and you can get that to move, therefore you create a scenario that is actually animated, um, you've got repeat loops in there, if, when, while, you can do all sorts of things, however complicated you want to make it, and the sky's the limit, it is absolutely amazing. Well, one of the things here as well, we give examples of tools that you can use, but we say to people, we make it open and very generic so you can choose and use what you've got already. Okay, so we're not saying you have to go out and buy something specific because we've given examples of where there are open source alternatives as well, and that's what's uh, that's what's quite that's what's very strong about it. Miles, hand over to you. I think we can, we're you. very tight on time, aren't we? So no minutes uh, left. absolutely no minutes left. So we've done a lot of it already. <laughs> as we're usual. Now at quarter past three, which is when the seminar's supposed to end. We're we'll coming finished in. Finished ten. We started finishing. Uh, as I'm happy to hang around and talk about I have some more slides of some scratch stuff if you'd like to stay. But if you want to get up and go and see some more of the show, please feel free. We won't be at all. How long do we think we've got left? Oh, about another I mean, 10 or 15 minutes? I, I, I'm happy to go on to. I'm aiming for sort of half past, but I'll let you choose. Actually, I can. Let me. Dash through a couple of points yeah. on the slides, and then we'll, we'll end with we'll end on a high with a little bit of scratch logo-y type demo. Okay, so very very quickly, Papa talked 
about the way we learn, and of course we learn through explore and experiment and all of that stuff, and we learn through talking, but Papert's insight was we also learn best through making things. And so much of the best learning in IT, the best learning in computing, is when we're making things for other people to see. Obviously, Papert working with Logo, we've talked about Turtle Logo already, but also the whole building block thing. You know, we do work with components that other people have created for us. And, and this was Froebel gifts, so and working at Froebel College at Manhattan University now, and how much children learn just through manipulating building blocks and putting things together. And so much of what we do on a computer is exactly like that. It's putting these components together. The Scratch stuff, which I want to show you, comes out of MIT's lifelong kindergarten project, another Froebel word there. And, you know, how do children learn in kindergarten? Well, they do play, they do experiment, they also make things, the finger painting. What's the digital equivalent of finger painting? Not a smartboard or an iPad, it's still finger painting, yeah? These are wonderful technologies for children to engage with, with their bodies. You know, anybody got a Kinect? Okay, Kinects are kind of brilliant, you know, just think about that sort of interface controlling a computer game. Bring that into the learning environment. Think what children could do with something like that. Who here has seen Ken Robinson's um, Why do school skill, or Do School Skill Creativity? Okay, no, this. watch the video. I'm not going to show you any of it now, but he says creativity. At its heart, you've got to have two things happening. You've got to be doing something original, and it's got to be something of value. And that having something of value is a really important point to that. When I was thinking about creativity and teaching in a sort of more creative way, I thought there were three elements to this, so one more than Sir Ken Robinson himself. I thought part of it was about the originality and the innovation, and that we as teachers should be willing to take risks and try things which other people haven't tried before. And lay at the back there saying, well, what if I come up with something which you know, doesn't work or doesn't have a shelf life? Far, far better to get it wrong than never to try these things. You know, it's going to be much more rewarding for you, your work as a teacher, coming up with your own idea to this than just using somebody else's. The other aspect was the playfulness which children bring to their learning, and why don't we get to play more? And I think there is this element to what our esteemed Secretary of State is letting us do now. We can have a go, we can try these things out, and okay, work in an iterative sort of way and adapt these things, depending on what happens, but also Quality counts, and we want the curriculum in our school to be the best it possibly can be. We want the children who are working on tasks for us in IT rooms or on laptops or devices to produce the best work that they possibly can. And saying to a child, you can do better than that, is absolutely fine. It really is. And one of the lovely things about the Scratch programming, and programming in general, is when it doesn't work, and the frustrations you get, and it doesn't do what I want it to do. And you learn so much through those processes, I think. We learn so much through those processes. So my three bullet points, briefly. And then, you know, written a few years ago, their space talking about young people's engagement with technology. But yeah, they are good at a lot of this stuff. They are information gatherers. They can type things into Google, other search engines are available. They can communicate with their friends. They know as much from this space. But look at those higher order skills. Moving them on from what they can do already to stuff which they can't yet to become producers of creative quality, creative work, and to be the digital pioneers. Those who are trying out new ideas with technology is where we can take a role as teachers. This is more of a switch on ICT. If we had time, I'd say, look at this, look at how much of this is about creative work, about them producing things. But we don't have time, so I'll move on. Okay, but it applies to children. It also applies to us as teachers. So do be willing to take a David Hargreaves, who was head of ILIA at ILIA's day. Anybody remember ILIA? Yeah, a few of you. Okay, saying that, look, the, the, the locus for innovation in education is teachers who are willing to tinker, who are willing to take things and change them. This wiki curriculum idea, you know, one of the lovely things about Rising Stars, it's not meant to be a commercial lecture, is that you know, some of this content is there as editable files on the CD-ROM. So if you don't like the way we wrote it, change it. That's fine, that's part of the, the intention here. And you know, this lovely word, bricolage here, about taking the things that we've got and then making them work in different ways, the toy hacking stuff and the, the playing around with things. I was going to say a few words about assessment, and I will if I'm going to allow myself to half past. Yet again, Officer's most recent report on the state of ICT in schools says, you're still not doing assessment properly. What is it that they say there? 
Um, the use of assessment was judged to be no better than satisfactory, as we know now satisfactory is a bad word from Austin's point of view, no better than satisfactory in 53 of the 86 primary schools. That's really not good enough. Folks, you know, that we sh you know, how come assessment doesn't work so well in ICT? Why is I answers to the room, answers from the room, please. Why do you think assessment in ICT is hard? What's your excuse when Austin come in and say you're not assessing ICT? Okay, and that's going to be easy when we remove the attainment target, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? It's not a measurable science. Ooh, go on, Michael. Well, you can obviously see if somebody can't use a mouse like one the adult I taught once who lifted the mouse up to see if the, the curtain would rise up the screen and down. And that was that was the screen. <laughs> um, but that was a, a, an adult. You know, the children tend to know how to use the mouse, they tend to know all these down and say, right, tick that box, then you can use the maths. Well, um, or this person can copy and paste and so on. I think I don't I think you you notice there's three bands. There's the excellent, there's the middle, and yeah. then those there those are there are those that learned to log on after four years, you know. And and, and I did have one uh, like that. But so um, nice. the, the thing is that it is it is um, it isn't as measurable as maybe maths and other things. That's then, interesting. So that's my input. Yeah, that it's hard to construct an attainment target. Um, I reckon, or brainstorming this beforehand, I think there are these three which are particular challenges of allows to make particular excuse for us when they come in. First, with this notion of embedded ICT, which is, I'm sure, the sensible way to do it, the curriculum mapping we were doing earlier. If you're trying to teach geography and ICT, it's all too easy to focus on the of geography and not so much the ICT. And Austin acknowledged this. If you're in a school where there's twice as many children as there are computers in the room, how can you tell they didn't work? That, does it matter for you to know? Well, Austin would say yes. Children know that They know that they didn't work. And also the distinction between task and process. If you see the printout at the end, if that's the only evidence you have to work with, how can you tell the, what, how they got that? the quality of the thinking, the willingness to explore, to experiment, confidence that they brought to that surely is one of the things we ought to be looking at. Um, Austin say in the best schools this was the sort of thing that was happening. I'm not going to give you very long to read that but you can read it for yourselves. This presentation we will put it's onto the interweb thingy and if you email us we'll send you the link to it. Um, this is actually on Ofsted's website. This is what they had to say rather than us. But the, the, the whole slide the stack will make available to you. And the recording. Third bullet point, really, really important. Self-assessment, peer assessment, or self-review, peer review, really important part of this process. They know whether they can do it. Don't lose track of that. Okay? And there are better questions to ask than can you use the mouse? Okay, um, that's really very, very clear, isn't it, at this range? This is what we have at the moment. For the next eight and a half months, we have this national curriculum attainment target there. But he didn't say it in the speech. It's there in the written statement. That's removed, too, from September. There is no level for ICT from the 1st of September. In Rising Stars, we based what we did on the APP scheme, but took APP for Key Stage 3 ICT and applied it to work in Key Stage 1, Key Stage 2, adapted the statements and linked them very specifically to what we had set up in the targets. And this was, I think, one of the things that people particularly appreciated from that scheme, that assessment was built into that process. And we also had children doing that sort of self-review. Uh, what were the things that they got out of it? How would they grade themselves on a number of scales there? But without an attainment target, where do we go? Is it something which we can measure? Well, General Blue, in his taxonomy, says, look, you have a hierarchy of skills there. And at a base level, can you remember what to do? Can you remember how well to type your password? You know, do you understand what's going on? Can you apply that understanding? But then look at that higher order stuff, that analysis, evaluation, and creating things afresh yourself. And that's probably where we head. That's some structure to an assessment or attainment target. And people have done more work with Bloom's taxonomy. And there are close links between Bloom's taxonomy and the attainment target as it stands for the next eight and a half months. Bloom's digital taxonomy is worth Googling, but not necessarily worth reading now. ICT really helps assessment. We have the whole e-portfolio thing. Who's using a blog in their school? What are you doing with it? 
So exciting. How's it going? Has it started well? Good luck with that. <laughs> Do get some touch on those, please. The blog is such a good way to provide that record of what they've done. I hope there are not a few, please, just the printing off things and putting them into folders. No, no, no. Oh, ask questions. <laughs> Don't embarrass anybody, but you know, put the stuff online. If it starts in the digital realm, keep it in the digital realm. Let them share it with one another. Let them share it with their parents and get that feedback from other people than just you. Um, so peer review, peer assessment work well on the web. And of course, computers can start marking things for you. Okay, five minutes. Very, very quickly. Scratch. That's so, And we were thinking about using our video cameras to video some of that and put that in an e-portfolio on our system so that people can see it if they want to or if they want to. When we have three-way conferences and three-way conferences with a portfolio and a folder, we need to and do it on the same video and have a you can do it as simply as that the blog is such a good way of doing it because yes they can store their, they can share their artifact on their blog the thing that they make their scratch game or their painting or their photograph or their whatever you can I, you do it as individual blogs shared, I would suggest privately within the school, so that each child has their own blog and the rest of the class can see what they've done and provide comments on that. And you, with the right sort of software, you can share it with their parents as well. And I can do it now too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think what we're seeing here is that the progression in the learning of the years of the pupils' work as well. So, this means we just put it here, that can carry with them. So, there's no focus of what they say, when it's printed out in the money you're saving in terms of printings, etc. There you are, it's there, you can see that. And the amazing thing is if you can have access by the parents, carers to actually see what the children can do as well, the they key, can be helping to support that away from school. The key thing is this notion of writing for an audience. In so much of school work, they write for you, their teacher, maybe for their parents if their parents are engaged with what's happening in school. And okay, some of the work goes up on the wall, but by no means all. If they're routinely putting this onto their blog, they have the audience of their classmates to share their work with. And I think that's a crucial part of the educational process of why, you know, the creativity here demands having an audience for this work. There are schools who are doing really exciting things with blogging by sharing it public with, publicly with the whole world. There are risks associated with that which you need to think through, but there are gains associated with that too. Okay, do you want, shall I do a little bit of scratch? I'll do a little bit of scratch. I'll do a little bit of scratch. Okay, we have here a little sprite. We can move him around, or at least I think I can move him around. That's our cute little scratch, scratch cat. There are other sprites. We can create our own sprite by just painting here. We have a, a set of instructions or an area here where we can write a script for the sprites. So we talk about characters, we talk about a stage, we talk about a script, and children know about following the, what it says in the script when they're on the stage. We, oops, Daisy, sorry. We then have a set of blocks which we can drag along here. So for instance, if I wanted to do the usual logo-y type thing of moving some steps, let's make it 100 steps, and turning through a 90 degree corner, I can do that. Everybody watching? Everybody got a prediction of what's gonna happen? Here we go. Moved and turned, moved and turned, moved and turned, moved and turned. Of course, with logo, what we would normally do is have a pen involved, so we can clear the screen to start with, pop the pen down, and then let's have a look at that, shall we? Clear the screen, put the pen down. I'll just drag that out of the way here. 
put the pen down. And there we go. There's something which you can do with a B-pot, yeah? We could, you notice that for a square there, we did the same thing how many times? Four times, very good. Aren't they a brilliant audience? Okay, so I'm going to clear the screen here. A good computer scientist is a lazy computer scientist, so I shouldn't really have to click that four times. I want the computer to do that four times for me. So just over on my control tab here, repeat four times, move a bit, turn a bit, and see what happens. Let's clear the screen and do that. And there we get a, a square drawn very, very quickly, yeah? Anybody, you'll remember from the dear old QCA schemes of work for, key st for year four, this crystal flower thing, where we take a simple shape like that and do several of them. So let's have a go at that. So let's make 10 of these squares in a row here. So repeat 10 times, drawing a square. Everybody knows what's going to happen? You know what's going to happen? It's going to go round and round. You nearly said in circles, didn't you? Okay, round and round of squares. So that's a bit boring. What we need to do then is to turn a bit after we've done each of those. So dra dragging that in there, 15 degrees. Let's see whether that works. Oops, sorry, I'm used to using the little green flag instruction. So whenever I click the green flag, do all of this. Oh. Okay, so what's my problem with my program here? It's not big enough. The 15 degrees isn't enough turn. Anyone would like to suggest a good number? 36. What an amazing coincidence. That's the one I was thinking of. I ought to have done a Darren Brown thing there, shouldn't I? Um, so let's try 36. Let's put that clear instruction in. Let's put the pen down instruction in. Click on the green flag. Isn't that pretty? And then we could put, if we wanted, another little move instruction in there. So let's move that about 30 steps on. Is this going to fall off the screen? We'll see. A crystal flower in about two or three minutes. That's half a term for year four, isn't it? <laughs> you might possibly take a little longer when demonstrating it with children. But this, I mean, that's just a really simple example of how to do logo like things inside Scratch. There are so many other things you can do. Um, let me see if I can find a fun one. So, change the current project. No. Desktop Scratch games. There we go. What have we got in here? Uh, Matt Plant's food chain game. This was one written by one of my first year undergraduates. We, this was two, two years ago. Now we had the, a little computing and creativity module. They had to produce a game in Scratch which had some educational purpose. So Ed's here is about sort of learning about the food chain. We have a set of instructions. Do I have to press space? Or? You just click on it. And then this is not working. Oh, yes, it chases the mouse. So the blackbird there is aiming to eat the ladybirds. And is done. Oh, and then another ladybird appears. And sooner or later, a sparrow hawk appears, which we have to avoid. There. Oh, and I'm dead. <laughs> okay. I mean, this isn't sophisticated programming. Some of the stuff we've done more recently where we take an example of a children's book and create a whole game world around that. I'm so impressed with what my student teachers have gone and done with Scratch. There's so much you can do with that. The idea behind Scratch is, what do they call it? Low floor, wide walls, high ceiling. So it's an easy thing to start, as I hope you've seen. You can do lots of sort of clever media type stuff and go on a long, long way. So Stanford University in the States using a modification of Scratch with their first year undergraduate students. Amazing. I'm going to put contact details. It's a very, very similar interface. Google Android App Inventor has now moved to another part of MIT's um, Media Lab. And so that, I think, sort of beginning of next month, you'll be able to download App Inventor off the MIT site and create apps using a very similar interface, which can, which can be packaged down, sold in the Android marketplace on a mobile phone. So the Secretary of State is saying, by the age of 16, we want children creating mobile phone apps. Oh, with a little bit of Scratch programming from year two onwards, and with App Inventor in year six, could do that by the time they leave primary school. Let's be ambitious for what these children can do. Hi. Uh, I just think with um, Scratch as well, there's a tendency to make the case for later. There's also the other one. So it uses the Yes. Yeah. 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 
I'd like to apologise that we have overran to thank you for being such an engaged audience with what we've been talking about and for your patience with us. But um, thank you all very much. Yeah, it's good night from me. And it's good night from me. <laughs>